Uh, hi, I'm Louis Rosenberg, CEO of Unanimous AI out here in sunny California. And today I'm going to be talking about regulating the metaverse. And I know that's a heavy topic. So let me start off with just a little background about myself and my experience in the metaverse. Uh, I got involved in the metaverse uh, over 30 years ago. I was a graduate student at Stanford University during the early days of VR. And I was lucky enough to get a gig uh, doing research at, uh, at NASA in a virtual reality lab. And I was studying um, vision systems, modeling interocular distance, the distance between your eyes in software and uh, spent hours and hours and hours in, uh, in virtual reality. And it was, I learned a lot, it was a great experience, but I also came away uh, wanting nothing more than to take the power of VR and splash it all over the real world. Um, and so I pitched the idea to the US Air Force and, uh, and they gave me a fellowship to create something called the Virtual Fixtures Platform, which um, was the, the first interactive augmented reality system that allowed you to uh, interact with real and virtual objects in a single mixed reality. And um, that was a great experience as well. Um, but what was most impactful to me was watching how excited people got when they tried virtual reality and augmented reality. And, and I realized I really wanted to turn this into a business. And so in 1993, I founded Immersion Corporation, one of the early VR companies. Um, we took the company public in 1999. I, I stayed until 2002. Uh, the company is still around today. It's probably the oldest virtual reality company out there. Um, as for me, I in 2004, I founded Outland Research, an augmented reality company uh, working on um, mobile computing. And um, that was acquired in 2011. And then in 2014, I founded Unanimous AI, my current company, which is about um, connecting groups of people together in shared environments to amplify their intelligence. Uh, all this said, I'm really, uh, I've spent my whole career really thinking about virtual reality, augmented reality, and uh, the metaverse. Uh, I've been excited about the potential for 30 years, uh, but I've also been terrified about the risks for the last 10 years. And, uh, and it's not the technology of the metaverse that I'm afraid of, it's the prospect of large corporations controlling the metaverse. And in fact, um, in 2008, I actually spent a year writing a, a graphic novel about the dangers of a co corporate controlled metaverse. So I spent a lot of time really thinking about all the things that, uh, that could go wrong. And that really in inspired me to, um, to share my thoughts over the last few years about why I believe uh, the metaverse uh, has the potential to, to be a very dangerous place if it's controlled by corporations. And so that brings me to regulating the metaverse. And so today, what I wanna talk about is, is first social media and really just talk about the lessons learned of social media uh, because we, you know, 20 years ago, uh, everybody was very excited about uh, the possibilities of social media to bring people together, to democratize the world. We saw it as a utopia. And over you know, two decades, we now feel like social media is creating a dystopia. So what are the lessons learned from that? And how can we then bring that to the metaverse? And, and I will talk about the metaverse. First, I'll give some basic definitions. So we're talking about the same thing. I'll talk about the inherent risks, which I believe are far worse than social media. And then I'll talk about can meaningful regulation help. And so social media, uh, from utopia to dystopia. Uh, I, I think at this point, most people uh, at least in, inherently feel in their gut that social media is creating problems. It's polarizing populations. It's spreading misinformation. Uh, it's reducing trust in institutions. Uh, just over the last few years, we've seen really significant uh, loss of trust in major institutions like the WHO. Uh, the CDC, the NIH. Um, we've also seen loss, uh, uh, reduction in, in trust in legitimate media, reduction in trust in the democratic process. Uh, ultimately, we're seeing social media damage society. So while everyone has a gut feel that this is happening, the Aspen Institute did something really valuable last year. They pulled together a commission of experts from various industries and specialties, and they rigorously studied the problem for six months, and they wrote a, um, an 80-page report. And they concluded that social media platforms wield enormous influence in the public sphere 
and their tools and algorithms facilitate and amplify misinformation and disinformation that are causing real societal harms. Um, again, this is after a really big study of, of, of the issues. What's most interesting to me here is this phrase, tools and algorithms, because it sounds innocent, but it's really the key. And the way I see it, the, the tools and algorithms of social media fall into three categories. Um, tracking users, targeting users, and monetizing users. And, um, and I want to start with monetizing users because social media has an ad-based business model. And what that means is that the users are the product being sold in exchange for free access. The problem is that this business model drives the two other pieces, tracking users and targeting users. Uh, where tracking users means that the social media platforms have expansive ability to know what you're doing by tracking where you click, what you buy, who you communicate with, who your friends are. Uh, they have vast amounts of information about every one of their billions of users. And they, they use that information to then target users with uh, targeted advertising paid for by third parties, uh, targeted news feeds uh, that are driving uh, information to particular people amplifying biases, uh, amplifying polarization, and targeted introductions. Actually, uh, they're actually controlling who you connect with. Now, it's this infrastructure that's actually driving all of the problems that we see. And so instead of calling it innocently tools and algorithms, I would call it the ecosystem of dystopia. And, um, and so if you look at the 80 page report on uh, information disorder from the Aspen Institute, it's one of the most interesting conclusions is that after 20 years of this, it's very hard to undo the damage. Uh, to, quote the, to quote the report, the core problems and challenges of this era are deeply rooted. Uh, we now rely on an infrastructure that's built this way, which now brings me to the metaverse. And, and my first and most important point about the metaverse is that now is the time to think about metaverse regulation. Let's not wait. 10 years or 20 years where the, where the problems are so deeply rooted, they just can't be undone like social media. And so what are the core problems that we can anticipate in the metaverse? I like to, to describe them as, again, three categories. In this case, monitoring users, manipulating users, and monetizing users. These are similar to social media, but I will point out how I believe that they are much, much worse. But first, let's just talk about what a metaverse is. So we're all using the same, uh, the same definition. Uh, I like to define the metaverse as a persistent and immersive simulated world that's experienced in the first person by large groups of simultaneous users who share a strong sense of mutual presence. It can be fully immersive virtual world. People are avatars. I would call that a virtual metaverse. It can also be layers of virtual content overlaid on the real world. I would call that an augmented metaverse. I point this out because the risks as well as the regulatory needs are, are different for virtual and augmented metaverse. There's a lot of commonality, but it's, it's worth talking about both uh, environments. So here we see two examples, uh, a virtual metaverse, augmented metaverse. Uh, personally, uh, my view is that uh, within 10 years, uh, most people will spend at least two hours a day in a virtual metaverse, shopping, socializing, entertainment, plus targeted business applications. Uh, on the other hand, the augmented metaverse, uh, uh, personally, I believe that within 10 years, this will replace uh, mobile phones as our primary interface to digital content. It will be how we, how we access our world in a, in a primary way. Um, when people are walking down the street, they won't be staring down at a phone. They'll be seeing content all around them. And I point this out because they, again, they have different uh, risks and different regulatory needs. So let's go back to these, these three things, which I call the three M's of the metaverse, the, the risks that we need to talk about. Let's focus first on monitoring users in social media. Uh, this means tracking where you click, what you buy, who you communicate with. In the metaverse, this becomes far more expansive and far more intimate. Now we're gonna, we're gonna see platform providers being able to track where you go, where you go in a virtual world, also where you go in the real world. Uh, augmented metaverse, GPS will be tracking you continuously. It has to be that way for the platform providers to be able to give you content. Track where you go, what you do, where you look, the direction of your gaze will be tracked 
how long your gaze lingers. Uh, are you looking at something showing interest? Are you walking down the street in a virtual or augmented world and stopping and looking in a store window? They will know that. They'll track your gait. Where are you slowing down? Where are you speeding up? Again, they will know that. They'll track your posture. Does your posture uh, show interest? Does it show some other emotion? They will very likely be monitoring your facial expressions and your vocal inflections and even your vital signs. Uh, I know people think vital signs is extreme, but smartwatches already do this. Um, and uh, there are other ways to monitor vital signs, even through cameras. When I talk about vital signs, I'm talking about monitoring your heart rate, your respiration rate, your pupil dilation, your galvanic skin response. All of this are things that are really being developed and uh, very likely to be tracked and monitored in the metaverse. In other words, metaverse platforms will monitor your whole life, what you do, what you say, what you experience, and what you feel. Yes, this is a privacy concern, but to me, that's, that's really the small part of it. The bigger issue is what the platform providers can do with this expansive and extensive and intimate information about, about all of their users. And what they will do is manipulate users. And, um, and again, social media, manipulating means targeted advertising, targeted news feeds, targeted member invitations. Metaverse platforms, the whole point of, of virtual reality and augmented reality is to fool the senses. That's what we've been doing for 30 years as we've been developing these technologies, making it uh, capable of, of fooling the senses at such a, a, an extreme level that we can create a suspension of disbelief. That defines a good VR or AR experience. In other words, blur the boundaries between the real and the virtual. In these worlds that can fool the senses and blur the boundaries, advertising will not be the pop-up ads and promo videos of social media. They will be much more intimate and, and ultimately the metaverse is the perfect environment for deception, coercion and misinformation. It's designed to fool the senses. So let's look at manipulating users. Uh, I see two big categories of, uh, of potential problems. Instead of advertisements, you know, pop-up ads and videos, uh, two key mechanisms in the metaverse will be virtual product placements and virtual spokespeople. So virtual product placements, these will be targeted experiences that are injected into your world as promotional content that you experience. Uh, again, they could, be, they could be products. And so you can imagine you're walking down the street in the metaverse, could be a virtual, a virtual street or a real street in an augmented reality. And maybe you see people walking the other way, uh, drinking a particular brand of, of energy drink. And you say, oh, that, uh, you just notice that as part of your world. And you walk a little bit further, you see somebody else. And, and eventually you start to think, wow, that, that energy drink is pretty popular. That's uh, maybe people around here like that. Uh, you, you will start to form uh, ideas about your world, about your community, based on what you're seeing, without knowing that that experience could have been injected into your world by the platform provider on behalf of a paying third party. And in fact, these experiences, these vir virtual product placements could be indistinguishable from authentic and serendipitous encounters. And so you're forming views about your reality, thinking that things are just, uh, you know, discoveries in your world, not realizing that they were placed there for you and, and not just placed there for everybody, placed there specifically for you. That will happen in, uh, in the metaverse. Going a little bit further, these don't have to be in inanimate objects. They can actually be uh, simulated spokespeople. And, and these will be uh, avatars, just like other avatars that you see in the, in the metaverse. Um, but they will be AI agent controlled avatars that engage you in promotional conversation. Um, it, this will actually be easy to do or easier to do in, in the virtual metaverse where everybody's an avatar. Everybody looks at right now somewhat cartoony, not difficult to have a cartoony uh, avatar controlled by AI uh, engage you. But over time, um, these will become indistinguishable from authentic members of the world. Uh, even, even in the augmented metaverse. Uh, and they will have access to vast amounts of data that have been collected about you through monitoring. They will know your history, your likes, your wants, your needs, your tendencies, where you go, how you react. They will be armed with this information. 
Uh, they also could be armed with uh, data from your facial expressions and vital signs and vocal inflections, and will be analyzing your emotions in real time. What this means is these simulated spokespeople will be able to pitch you more skillfully than any used car salesman. Uh, they, will, they will engage you in promotional conversation. You may not realize that they are not a real person, but uh, an AI agent with an agenda. They will be monitoring your reactions in real time, adjusting their pitch, seeing when you're, when you're uh, interested, seeing when you're bored. Uh, and it, these will be uh, AI technologies that are personified with the entire goal of persuading you, the entire goal of manipulating you on behalf of a paying advertiser. And again, it doesn't have to just be that they're pitching products or services. They could be pitching political messages. They could be uh, really pitching any type of content with the goal of influencing you. And you may not know that they were injected to target you. And I know some people think that, um, oh, you'll be able to tell the difference. It was actually uh, a really interesting study that just came out this year, uh, a few weeks ago from Lancaster University, where they looked at um, AI generated faces, the latest technology used to generate, uh, generate human faces and they found uh, by testing on, on large numbers of people that they are now indistinguishable. People cannot distinguish between a real human face and a completely AI generated human face. And these images here are all uh, AI generated. And, and that's a little bit scary. What was far more scary was that they also uh, asked people to, to, ju to judge the trustworthiness of faces. And they found that the simulated people created by AI were perceived as more trustworthy than the real people. Why is this terrifying? This is terrifying because this is going to be the motivation that allows, that drives advertisers to use simulated spokespeople. They don't have to pay actors. They don't have to pay uh, representatives. Uh, these AI agents can be smart. They can be monitoring your emotions and they're inherently more trustworthy. This will happen. It's not that far off. Finally, let's talk about monetizing users. Uh, again, in social media, users are the product for sale to advertisers, they're not the customers. And this drives the whole ecosystem of dystopia. In metaverse platforms, I think we have every reason to believe that the users will be the product for sale to advertisers and not the customer. Um, that at least is the direction the world is headed. It all starts with the advertising model on top. That's what drives the platform providers to monitor users and they will monitor very extensively in, in the metaverse. And then that will drive uh, these very immersive uh, uh, advertising methods, virtual product placements, virtual spokespeople, and other promotional experiences. Promotional experiences where third parties are paying to change the world around you without your knowledge uh, to deliver a message or some other promotional experience. Now, there's some solutions that are not regulatory. And, um, and again, if this is the ecosystem of dystopia, one non-regulatory solution that could really help this is to get rid of the advertising model, uh, to for platform providers to adopt subscription models instead, where people are paying a monthly fee um, in order to get access to the metaverse. If that happens, that will significantly reduce the motivation to monitor users and to inject uh, these advertising methods into the metaverse. While this would be a really good direction to protect consumers, we really can't predict that it will happen. Uh, it's really up to the public to be willing to pay subscriptions. Um, but everything tells us historically that very likely uh, the public will, will adopt or, or accept an advertising-based business model. If there's an advertising-based business model, I think we need to have some level of, of regulation to protect consumers. So let's first look at monitoring users. And again, the metaverse will, will uh, create an environment where the platform providers can inherently track where you go, what you do, what you look at, how long your gaze li lingers. Uh, these experiences are very intimate. I believe that A, transparency uh, should be regulated. Platform providers should need to reveal what is being tracked and when it's being tracked. Uh, if you're walking down the street and you look into a store window, you should be informed hey, the platform provider is monitoring these behaviors. They know what you're doing uh, and you shouldn't be allowed to forget that that's happening. I also believe that there should be uh, no profiling 
meaning what well, well, it's, it's uh, inherently important that the platform providers track these things in order to create the virtual experiences in real time. They don't have to save this data. They don't have to store it beyond their ability to just create the virtual experience in real time. If, there's, uh, if we push for no profiling, that would mean that the platforms would need to limit the storage of the data they track. They can't track and, and then recall your behaviors from the past in terms of uh, where you look, how you slowed down, what your posture was like. Because if they have this historical data, they can profile you and they can predict your actions and your reactions and your behaviors with such accuracy, they'll be able to then use that later to manipulate you. So um, keeping, this, keeping the data uh, as real time and not stored would be a big protection to consumers. Uh, the other type of data that, that will be monitored are monitoring not just, your, not just your experiences, but your reactions, your facial expressions, vocal inflections, posture, gait, vital signs. Uh, again, transparency. If, if a platform uh, is using AI to process your expressions and inflections to determine your emotions in real time, uh, emotional analysis, sentiment analysis, you should be informed. You should be told that that's happening and when it's happening. Again, no profiling, you shouldn't be allowed to store these things over time. Uh, because again, if they can store your emotional and sentiment data over time, they can start to predict how you will react in different situations and manipulate you uh, even more successfully. And, and I believe that there should be a ban on tracking and storage of vital signs, heart rate, respiration rate, um, for anything that's not medical. Uh, there, these technologies are being developed for medical uses, smartwatches, et cetera. Um, but for anything that's not medical, they should not be allowed to use your heart rate to advertise to you. Now let's look at manipulating users. Um, virtual product placements and other targeted experiences that come into your world. Uh, first thing again, transparency. Uh, platforms should need to reveal what's injected into your world by a paying third party. If you're walking down the street and you see somebody holding a, a sports drink, if that's not real, if that was injected into the world to target you, to change your perception, it needs to be highlighted, it needs to look different. You need to be informed in real time that that was placed there for you. You also should be informed who is the paying third party and what their agenda is. And then this extends to virtual spokespeople, these AI-driven agents. Uh, again, transparency. You need to be able to distinguish between authentic avatars that represent other people in the world and AI agent avatars that, are, that have a promotional agenda. They should look different. They should also need to reveal when you're targeted by promotional conversation. If an avatar engages you in conversation or just makes a passing comment walking past you on the street, you know, it's telling you something, you should, be, you should be informed that that's a promotional conversation and not just a natural, a, a natural authentic interaction uh, with some other member of the, of the metaverse. They should also have to reveal who the third party is, including state actors. You know, I, I've been talking mostly right now about you know, ab, you know, advertisers who are pushing products and services. But state actors can do the same thing. You could be walking down a street in a metaverse and see a group of people protesting something. And you could, again, you could think, oh, I, there's people in my community who are upset about this, uh, this particular thing, they're protesting. And you might not realize that that was, you know, those are uh, placements put in by a third party. And that third party could be a state actor, could be a government that's trying to influence your, um, your view of the world. And, um, and I do think there should be a ban on promotional AI agents that react to your emotions in real time. If you're engaged in a promotional conversation, they should not be able to be looking at um, your facial reactions and your vocal inflections and your vital signs to adjust their, uh, their pitch in real time. So some concluding marks uh, about the metaverse. Uh, I believe the metaverse will happen. It will transform society over the next 10 years. Um, I believe the problems will be very similar, but actually much worse than today's social media. And because of this, I believe now is the time to think about metaverse regulation. Um, we shouldn't do what we did with social media, which is wait until these problems are so ingrained in the infrastructure and the ecosystem that we can't undo them. Uh, let's regulate them now. Thanks. <laughs>